You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts. Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management, along with Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian and Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again. Turn that radio dial up to 11 because it is time to commence our broadcast week here on the old Options Insider Radio Network. My name is Mark Longo. I will be your host, your guide, your leader down the dark pathways of the options market this week. Kicking things off, of course, with episode one of the bi-weekly options extravaganza known as the Option Block, what the cool kids call the old OB. If one of our legion of on-demand listeners, all we ask, if you like what you hear, keep rating and reviewing. It does help all the new folks continue to discover the content these days. Of course, if you want to go above and beyond, you want to get extra shows like our great pro Q&As, another one coming up tomorrow. We got options out of these every Friday. Just gave away a sweet pro trading crate. Another one's getting loaded in the chamber, ready to go out for our pro trading giveaways. Of course, live for any show you want, whatever your heart desires, whatever your schedule allows throughout the week, and a whole bunch more, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. Hello to all of our new folks who are joining us out there. These I, don't, I should probably go through and welcome you. I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> but welcome to all of you folks out there. We love you all. And, of course, let's see who's joining us today that we love. Actually, before we get to that, you know what? It is Monday. We have to kick off the network proper. And there's only one way to do that, listeners. It's the way we have been doing now for quite some time. We go back into the well. And we guess that 80s wrestler via the majesty of their theme music. The 80s, of course, the halcyon days of professional wrestling. The music was the best. The wrestlers were bigger than life. It was all kinds of good stuff. We've gone through a lot of the uh, the top names and even the secondary and even the, the, the tertiary names now in the world of 80s pro wrestling. So I was discussing over the weekend with my son. I was like, he's, he's the current modern wrestling aficionado. I asked him, who should we do? for the wrestler this week because we've done a lot of the big ones and he thought given the big events of the weekend which there was an 80s wrestler who has now moved on a a past tense 80s wrestler he was very much in focus this weekend in the real wrestling that is going on right now there was a big event this weekend and there was one iconic 80s wrestler who was very much invoked (laughs) in fact in the main event they came out in this person's gear and everything else so very much an 80s wrestler front and center, especially given the dramatic events that unfolded, everyone talking about it. It seemed appropriate to go back to the well with this one. This was a big star back in the 80s, even though not always. W- I think WWF was kind of later in his run. He did a bunch of other kind of regional stuff as well, but very much a well-known one. Can you name this 80s wrestler? American Dream. Common man working hard with his hands. 
American dream <laughs> very much front and center again this weekend. Let's go around the horn. Let's start with a guy who has no idea who that is. He is, of course, the rockingest of lobsters, Mr. Andrew Drivenazzi from optionpit.com. Mr. G, welcome back to the program A and B. G- just just name an 80s wrestler at this point. Maybe you'll get lucky. Soon. Is uh is I, I was thinking like, wasn't there a guy called Macho Man? Something like that. There was a guy called Macho Man, <laughs> one of the most iconic '80s wrestlers, perhaps of all time. But no, that was not him. But at least, you oh, were, at least you were uh, in the ballpark, sir. So I, I, could, I, I felt I was. Was I in the right decade? You were Macho Man, very much a contemporary of this fellow. So yes, well done, sir. All right, there we go. I got my participation. <laughs> I doff my cap to you. Your certificate <laughs> is in the mail for participating. All right, let's go out now to our unclest of mics, Mr. Uncle Mike Tusaw. From St. Charles Wealth Management. Hey, welcome back to the program. And B, sir, I know you know this one. Who who are we talking about? The American Dream, sir. The American Dream, Dusty Rhodes. Yes, that is correct, sir. Did you get a chance to see any of the drama that unfolded around him and his legacy and his son this weekend, sir? I did not, unfortunately. But uh, it was kind of a busy weekend. But um, he's the American Dream. You got to love him. Um him and Ric Flair had their feuds for many years. And uh, Dusty Rhodes, he was something else. I mean, back in his day, I remember when um, his friend turned on him. Uh, I forget who it was that turned on him one time, but they showed a replay of it. And he said, I don't know what was wrong. I don't know why he turned on me. If it was money, I'd have given it to him. If it was fame, he can have it all. He was my friend. And he was just, he was, he was the man of the people, Dusty Rhodes. Man of the people, indeed. Yeah, the reason he's so front and center now is because his son has made a very uh, big, popular, triumphant return to WWE recently, and he was in a main event this weekend against someone who came out. The guy fighting him came out in Dusty's gear, Uncle Mike, with the polka dots and everything, and he was doing all the, all the Dusty stuff. So it was very much him. And the, what made it doubly dramatic is that Dusty's son had a real-life horrible injury that was obviously very visible. He tore the pectoral off the bone in his right side of his body. So he was clearly visibly very injured and they still let him go out there to wrestle. It was very surprising. I think a lot of people were shocked that this guy was allowed and medically cleared uh, to go into this match where he was obviously very visibly and injured. And so that was, that was the drama that was trending on Twitter, all this craziness. So it seemed appropriate given the fact that the American dream was front and center again this weekend to play him on as we play into our next segment. It is time for the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, everybody. Welcome to the trading block, the portion of the show where we break down what the heck is trading, what is lighting up our markets. Looks like our chat was all over it. They knew it was Dusty Rhodes. Uh, They're probably hip on what was going on this week. And by the way, thank you for your congratulations. Yes, another big flag football championship. This weekend here in Chicago it was a fun one. Our kids stuck it to the man, shall we say. This in honor of Dusty Rhodes. We took on a very much older, much bigger, much more experienced team. And we took it to him. So that was always fun. So, so the kids to be able to hoist that trophy at the end of the day. The coach and I were, my co-coach and I were both pretty excited as well. I'm not going to lie. So it was a very triumphant weekend here in, uh, in Chi-Town, which is always fun. Like also a bit of a triumphant market going on here to not quite as triumphant as it was when things commenced earlier today. The markets were looking pretty robust, uh, well north of 4150 when they kicked off today. Got up to almost looks like almost not quite 4170, but 4165 or so in that ballpark. 
have given up a lot of that now. The S&P is still up about a third of a percent. I got around 41 and a quarter or so right now. Uh, the Dow is pretty much unched. And the NASDAQ, which had been uh, charging north uh, earlier this morning, I believe up as much as uh, 2% at one point now, up about a third of a percent. So it's another one of these days where we start off, seems like we're heading in one direction pretty firmly. And then it kind of a bit of an about face mid-session and things start to change a little bit. Will we end the day flat or even red? Who knows? We've already have come off uh, markedly off the highs. When we kicked off the show here, VIX was at about a 2560. Listener that puts it up a little over a point, about 1.1 points from where it was on Thursday's episode. VIX, again, kind of the story going on out there right now is this whole VIX thing. In fact, we had a great poll about it last week. We'll reveal the results a little bit later. But VIX still at a 91. It's up a whopping two points, but it's still not enough to break the 100 handle. So, yes, VIX, you got to go all the way back. Over a year to find pretty much the last period before this one that it was below 100. And every other time since March of 2020, it only just briefly dipped. It had a brief visit, a brief flirtation below 100 before it exploded back up north into the triple digits. Right now, we've been hanging out here for over a week. So interesting times afoot from a vol, a vol perspective. VXX, what the hell even is this thing anymore? I'll leave it up to you guys to determine that. 22 and a quarter. Up almost half a point from where it was on Thursday's show. Uh, UVXY, 13 and a half. That puts it up about a third of a point. Uh, SVIX, 1160. SVIX, of course, the new inverse product. That's down a little over a tenth of a point, about 0.15 from where it was this time last week. It's not a huge mover there. Uh, UVXY, the 2X levered product, 1570 when we kicked off the show. Up a little over half a point, about six tenths of a point. And VOLQ, the at the money vol of the NASDAQ, hanging out at about a 30 even, up about half a point. So, Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, you were victorious in our Guess That Dusty Roads challenge. <laughs> so I will allow you to go first. Do you have any other enduring memories of uh, the American dream or perhaps the majesty that is flag football? Have at it. And then be more importantly, sir, what is lighting up your tape today? And it's, it's still an Uncle Mike. Oh, the Dow might just have just ticked red, sir. So maybe not entirely an Uncle Mike day anymore. Well, uh, hold on. It's flat. It's flat. It's flat. Uh, it's still flat. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, I mean, the American dream, Dusty Rhodes, the man's man, man of the people, uh, Dow's positive again. <laughs> um, but yeah, he had some cuts on his forehead. He was not afraid to do whatever it took to make the people happy. And you got to admire that about a, a professional wrestler. And in terms of uh, I-9 football, it's a phenomenal thing. Uh, I coached my son many years in it. And uh We'd always do well, but we could never quite close the deal. We got to second place once, but we seemed like we got third place every year in the league, but we could never quite beat the big team. So, uh, Mark Longo, you're the, you're the, you have something as a football coach that I do not. So got to come on down to, to downtown. To we'll show you how to do it down here, sir. You got to show me how to do it. But uh, unfortunately, I'm sad to say my I-9 days are over. Uh, my son's in high school now, so um well, that'll be one football championship. I will never know what it feels like to win that you will. So my hat's off. Some call me the Lombardi of I-9. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. I'm just saying it. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though. You wouldn't have messed with my defense back in the six- and seven-year-old era. We, we had a brutal defense. You were not going to get by on us. <laughs> so, But... Um, but yeah, just a quick note on I-9. One of the highlights of my coaching career is in the, for I-9 is in the early days, you can't run the ball when you're inside the five-yard line because they want to make sure there's fewer collisions. And so what I would do is I would, if it's first and goal from like the four-yard line, I'd have the quarterback take a knee to put to the six-yard line to then throw the ball. Parents from the other team would just holler and scream and were just livid that I did that. So the next time I had on the four yard line, I kneeled the ball. Then they're all screaming, "He's going to throw it! He's going to throw it!" Then we ran the ball in on him. So I was that I was that guy in I nine. So maybe I didn't deserve to win a oh. nine nine championship. So you you but, took um, the sportsmanship lessons to heart, sir. I did, but uh, but I will say this though: I always played everybody. That was one thing that I had a very good reputation for. Was always playing the in I nine. You 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 have to play all. Everyone gets to get carries, get the ball, that type of thing. I was always very good about that, even if. I had a lot of special needs kids on my team, and so I was very proud of uh, Billy getting some carries and uh, really helped Billy in his development, which, quite frankly, is what youth sports is all about, and I'm very proud of being a part of that. But with that, now that the Dow went negative, when I'm talking pro wrestling and youth flag football, um, 
Today is interesting in that we did come charging out of the gates, but then now uh, we lost some steam. It seems that uh, right now we have like a we're kind of just bumming around between 4,100 and 4,200 uh, in the S&P. We, we've gotten as high as uh, last Thursday, I believe. We got to um, 4,180 or somewhere around the, those lines. We couldn't quite get through the 4,200 mark. I remember talking about that on the show on Thursday. Uh, so we haven't quite gotten there. Uh, what's interesting is not last week, but the week before, uh, from I believe it was Friday the 20th or, or a couple of weeks ago on the Friday, where we just all of a sudden just reversed very quickly in the S&P. Uh, if you go from that low, it was on yeah Friday the 20th, 38.10 to the peak roughly a week later, that following Friday, it was nearly a 10% uptick. We went from 38.10 to a high of 41.58. And so when doing that, I think it was about a 9% uh, trough to peak rally. And then last week, to follow it up, we had roughly a 1% downturn in the market. So if we have that, if we go up 10% or 9% one week and then down 1% the next week, I'm cool with that. I can live with that every, every week for the rest of all of eternity. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Uh, we did have a little bit of a pullback last week when we were down the 1% on the week. Most of that came on the Friday. And so now... This is kind of the crapper get off the pot week for the market, I believe, meaning that are we going to continue to rally because we've gotten a, we've had the rally uh, not last week, but the week before. And then last week we did pull back a little bit to kind of gain some traction or let the market catch, his bre catch its breath, whatever analogy with which you want to use. But now's the time I believe this week is where we're going to see if we can if la we're going to see the truth about last week, whether the market was just catching its breath or whether the market uh, has more to go or whether the market's going to uh, just kind of go down and look really ugly this week. So I think we are going to get some movement this week just based on the fact that two weeks ago we had a rally to the upside. Last week we kind of puttered around a little bit. And then what are we going to do this week? That's uh, I think we're going to have some pretty decent movement, but uh of course, the market knows better than me. That's why they're the market and I'm not. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm seeing right now from a technical standpoint. Uh, we do have a sell-off in bonds again today. Uh, the sell-off came before the sell-off in stocks happened because we did rally a bunch early and then we've sold off. So we do have that happening. A uh, little bit of upside in silver. Uh, but other than that, uh, normally what seems like we've been used to talking about is the big story has been oil. Oil is this, oil is that, but uh, oil is relatively flat on the day. So I think it's kind of interesting that uh, oil is not the big thing today. But what is unique in, in the commodity realm uh, that I think is a big story, uh, at least for the time being, is natural gas. Holy cow, that is having a big old whopper of a day today. Uh, it's up to 931 uh, the recent high for natural gas was on May 26th at 9.45. So we might make another run at that high for natural gas. And so uh, that is the commodity to be watching today at this stage, or at least from the th the, what's lighting up my tape. Uh, we do have that. And I think that if natural gas continues to go higher, um, that's not going to bode well for uh small business in terms of uh, people who are dependent on natural gas, like the dry cleaners or people that actually need the natural gas to make things work. And so from there, I think that's something to definitely keep an eye on. Uh, oil's elevated, natural gas is getting there, but uh, where's that going to go? It's something to keep a, an eye on. And uh, by the way, just a friendly reminder, Bitcoin still sucks. I don't care if it is up today. Did you finally make that bid for that URL, sir? I should. I I I, I should. That'd you might get you might get more traction now that it's in a bit of a downtrend these days. You might get more visitors to that URL. Now is the time to strike, sir. Bitcoinsucks.com. Make that offer. You strike while the iron is hot. Let's go on out to the land where he always thinks Bitcoin sucks. He's always just kind of grumpy. It's the dark and stormy shores of Maine. You understand. You live under that cloud all day. It's gonna affect your mood. Mr. Rock Lobster, sir, what is lighting up your tape on this? Uh, was an Uncle Mike type of day now, maybe not so much. Well, it wasn't Uncle Mike. You know, I'm, 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 I am optimistic. I'm an optimistic person, I would say. 
you know, I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> how, very however, cautiously. Very cautiously. How, uh, very ca- However, uh, well, what I think, you know, was just I had a couple of uh, sessions this morning with students. And so first off, you get some really weird things going on overall. Like, and because I know Mike looks at the like technical levels and I look at like, so just kind of like vol levels, right? So realize vol. Uh, like S and P 500 realized fall is the highest level it's been since the pandemic. Um, the 30 day average, and it's and it's not even close. By the way, it's like, it, <laughs> so you know, for whatever reason, the market's uh, deciding to have a bout of uh, like the I don't know what's going on, you know, kind of thing happening. So you got that. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, so we have a very very volatile. Uh, Mike was talking about swings. Yeah. Cause realize vol 30 day realized vol is 32%. And that's as high as it's been since like what, April of 20, April of 2020. And it's again, not even close. So you've got huge swings, right? However, the volatility in VIX is at a, uh, <laughs> is at like almost a two year low. So it's really weird. Uh, you know, confluence of like extremes. Like we have relatively low implied vol in VIX and we have relatively high uh, realized vol in SPX. So I just, I like most things uh, is in 2022. It's like a weird, it's things you don't see very often together. I guess if that will, this will be the year, we'll just call it things you don't see often together. So how do I read that? I read that as first off, since VIX is already 25, we're already in the danger zone again, another day. It's like it's like it's normal, right? Uh, with realized vol that high though, VIX isn't even that ex- you know, um, I mean, implied vol isn't even that expensive. The 30 day straddle is two hundred and ten dollars, I believe, in SPX. And I think what three weeks ago, it might have been 260, 270, right around that level. Um, when VIX was in the 30s. So at this point, um, the market seems to be happy with the the range that the straddle is giving. Um, and because we stay in it. Um, so that range takes us down to what, 3,900. So nobody is really, at least the way I view it, nobody is paying up to see a number really lower than that. And on the flip side, from a range point of view, there's really no breakout, right? So, like, are stocks cheap? Well, you know, I think the big tech stocks are still not cheap companies. Apple is not. I mean, Facebook is now has a relatively low multiple. Google is approaching, I believe, like a, a, a multiple in the teens, which for that growth company is pretty amazing. I think it's getting close. So let's Let's call Google like a reasonable multiple, maybe. Uh, yeah, twenty. It's twenty times plus all the cash they have in the bank, which is like a gajillion dollars. Yeah, they have two hundred dollars in cash per share, about ten percent of the value of the company's in cash. So Google is now a a team multiple, which is not unreasonable. Um, oil companies, I mean, oil prices are sky high. So who knows what the heck those are worth, right? Um, I think Apple is still a relatively expensive company. Um, <clears throat> Microsoft, I think, from a multiple point of view, is relatively expensive, although the market loves it. Um, Netflix got taken down to earth. Uh, Facebook got taken down to earth. Amazon, their multiple has been getting slammed. Um, So you've got like so you have that kind of side of the coin where the market has adjusted quite a bit. Like I think Amazon's multiple still is pretty big considering how large the company is, but it's not two trillion anymore. It's one point two trillion. So. You've had this big, uh, you know, and where's the growth going to? It's not going to be COVID growth anymore, right? So all that stuff is kind of off to the wayside, and they're just they're going back to being where they were. Um, Congress might have their say in big tech, but that's a big chunk of the valuation. So if I think you look at stocks, I don't think they look crazy priced anymore uh, from that point of view. I think they're kind of actually a lot of stocks are reasonable. All those. All those crazy growth stocks, they lost like 80, 90% of their value. So they got, you know, 
I don't know where you go once they're 10 bucks, like where do they go, right? Um, or they're 20 bucks or 15 bucks, they've gotten just annihilated. So like, so I would say the market's probably getting to a more reasonable level. I don't think it's super cheap, um, but it's reasonable, right? So you got that. So what everybody, the big concern now is, okay, like all this macro stuff, you got the this huge inflation number, because we don't really know how that's going to shake out, right? Is it going to be super big? And uh, we're going to have, you know, and then the Fed will have to be more aggressive, which I think would be really bad. That sends us down another 100, 150 points at least. Um, so we're now waiting for that number this week. That's a Friday number, you know, and then, you know, it, the conventional wisdom is that QT is bad. Quantitative tightening is bad because they're taking money out, which I think overall it needs to be done anyway to kind of get some sort of reality <laughs> back into government and you know uh, the whole monetary and fiscal situation we have. So these are so the market is sitting here waiting for something to happen. I think that was part of uh, Mar uh, Mike's point about you know we're going up, we're going down, we're going sideways. I think we're, this is kind of a sideways. It's just sideways waiting for this number. Um, there was a little bright spot where the Chinese are like, well, we're not going to be so mean to our companies anymore. Um, and there's there, some of the lockdowns are easing. Um, I don't know what happened, if it helped or not. But anyway, so I think you've got those, those things going on. Um, and <clears throat> I think the uh, – so – it's hard, like I would say the vol trade is a hard trade, especially for this, the June cycle, because everything really is going to be dependent on what happens Friday, I think, um, if we get some kind of telegraph going forward. Um, so you, you just have a lot of this odd stuff going in sort of different directions. And and I can't tell you or not if I think if the realized vol is dead in, um, in SPX. I don't, I, don't, I don't think it is, especially because we have to keep waiting for these numbers and how and how uh, and how bad like the inflation thing is, I because gas prices aren't going down, nat gas prices aren't going down. You know, grocery bills are still. I don't know if anybody looks, but I think everybody's grocery bills got to be up at least twenty percent to twenty five percent since last year. So like these are real these are real things that eventually will start to squeeze demand somewhere. Um, but anyway, we're we're sitting here. We're sitting at a twenty five VIX. SPX is basically had a little bit over one percent range today, and I don't think any of that's changing until we until something on this macro level becomes a little more uh, certain. Uh, right now, it still looks like the market is expecting the Fed to uh, be pretty aggressive raising rates, and I don't think that's going away anytime soon. Does not appear to be going away. Let's see if anything else is going away here. If things are coming back up. Here on the market, at least from a volume perspective, we're kind of seeing one of those decent days, not blow the doors off, but not nothing either. It's not like we're hanging out in the middle of August or middle of December either. VIX closing in on a quarter of a million contracts. It sounds like a lot. It's decent paper. 248 right now. Uh, the ADV is 571, though. It doesn't seem like we're going to make it that way today. But hey, this, the day is still young. We could we could see how things progress in the latter half of the session. SPY closing in on 4 million contracts. 3.9 million. Th easy for me to say. 3.93 million contracts. The ADB is about seven and a quarter right now. So SPY looking firm, looking robust. Uh, the S, 970,000. The ADB, 2.14 million. So a little bit light on the S front. Always interesting to see how that works. See, SPY doing a little bit more paper. S doing a little bit less. Uh, IWM, nobody touching it today. Nobody playing in small caps. 236,000 contracts on the tape. Uh, the ADB out there is nearly 800,000. So going to go out on a limb and say probably not going to hit that today. The Q is 1.64 million. The Q is looking like they're pretty much firmly entrenched for another ADV or stronger date. The ADV out there right now, 2.86 million contracts. Let's get on out to the single names, see how things are lighting it up out there. And, you know, these days, it seems like we either have a single name day or we have like a broad index day. We very rarely have both. And today is kind of a, a light day on both, I guess you could say, because it only cost you 182,000 contracts to break into the top 10 today. That gets you all the way to the king of the apes, at least for right now, that's AMC. Uh, it's off about almost 5%, right around 1185 right now, off about 60 cents. Good for, again, number 10, 182,000 contracts. That's pretty light paper for breaking into the top 10. Number nine, we've got Didi. This one's been making all the rounds out there. You see all the headlines up 50% or whatever, you know, 
reining it in a little bit. The stock's only 255. <laughs> it's still up 37% or a whopping 70 cents. But you see all these histrionic headlines, DD blowing the doors off. Yeah, okay, it's a $2 stock. Dial it back a bit. 197,000 contracts on the tape, though. So even though the stock is cheap, folks were still piling into the options. I guess that puts the lie to some of our polls we've had out there where what is your break even or what is your cutoff point, I should say, on how low is too low on the stock anyway before you will not trade the options? It seems like there really is no limit because nearly 200,000 contracts going up on DD when it was well shy of a buck earlier this morning. Facebook, a day that ends in Y. Facebook's probably going to be in our top 10 today. It is there at number eight, 201,000. Same for Neo, day that ends in Y. Neo is going to be there somewhere. Today is number seven, 240,000. You could do the same rinse and repeat for NVIDIA as well. Number six, 272,000. Number five, it seems like all is right in the land of China again because all these big Asian names and Chinese names are rallying. Uh, we got Baba up six and a quarter, or nearly 7% today, trading around, right around 99 and a half. Good for number six, 272,000. Actually, number five, 273,000. It's a, a point, a thousand above uh, the good old NVIDIA. Number four, AMD, 339,000. Number three, yes, I said number three, it's Tesla. Kind of an anemic day for Tesla in spite of the headlines, you know, uh, coming in, threatening to maybe cancel his deal there again, which is this whole backwards negotiating philosophy of Musk has me scratching my head. You come in, you say you're going to buy something, you agree to a price, and then you negotiate and do your due diligence after. That should probably come first whenever you're negotiating for anything. I'm just saying, probably a good practice to do that, as opposed to agree on a deal, and then I don't know if I want to do this, and I want to negotiate in public and all this other nonsense. I told you, all you Twitter folks, once Musk gets involved, here comes the drama. Hope you like it. Good for 630,000 contracts today on the Tesla side, at least up eight and a half bucks or seven, 12. Maybe folks don't want Tesla folks don't want him wasting his time or his money on Twitter. So rally in this one. Number two. Yes, I said number two. It's Apple. Everyone's waiting for the big WWDC to see what they're going to announce out there. Apple kind of in uh, kind of hanging out mode up about half a percent right around 146 right now. Good for 659,000 contracts. And then number one, this one threw me at first when I pulled it up because I forgot today was the split day. <laughs> it's Amazon. 2.11 million contracts on the tape for Amazon. I am not used to seeing Amazon at a 125 handle. <laughs> That's like back when it first went public. Oh, 125. I'm not used to seeing it with many more, many more digits at the end of that. Of course, today is the day of their 20 for one stock split listeners. So seeing Amazon at a 125, oh my goodness, it's so cheap. I must buy some. Uh, 2.11 million contracts on the tape for Amazon. So that old argument that cutting the price really does drive a lot more paper, certainly true in the case of Amazon right now. My goodness, yeah, that just, that threw me for a loop. Amazon at 125. It's been some time, listeners. It's also been some time since we've seen a new trading floor. SIBO launching a new trading floor here in the old Board of Trade building. Today in Chicago, I saw some pictures floating around. You can look if you find them. If you search for us or search for Cebo on the internet, listeners, you will find the release with the photos of it. It does look very light and airy compared to the old. There's actually windows that you could see, and there's sunshine coming in. Doesn't seem like you're in the bowels of humanity anymore out there. So that's kind of interesting. Everything old is new again. A new trading floor, listeners. You have to check out the release, or if you follow us on Twitter, we'll retweet it there for you. Uh, interesting stuff. They refer to it as a new and enhanced trading floor with a vibrant technology-driven environment that seamlessly integrates both open outcry and electronic trading mechanisms to provide customers a truly unrivaled world-class experience. Uh, customers continue to find value in open outcry trading for price discovery, deep liquidity, and execution quality. There we go. I know they have their new offices, which are right down the street here from our studio, but they still have the floor pretty much adjacent to where the main SIBO floor used to be. Back in the day, listeners, as we keep on rolling, it is time to go forward in life now. Time to go into the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. Everybody, welcome to the Odd Block, the portion of the show where things get weird, things get wild. We highlight some unusual activity, or at least we unleash our eye of Sauron, and it does that for us. 
Our chat saying there's a new pit. Crazy. Yeah, it is kind of crazy if you think about it. But on the other hand, there is still a lot of value in open outcry. A lot of the big institutions still want to call the pit and work in order, get that what they call the high touch execution, especially for complicated multi-leg spreads that go up in pits like the S and stuff. So it's not all buying your one lots of AMC out of the money calls and getting executed in sub sub second time frames. It's a lot more goes on on the institutional side. It needs a little bit more time and a little bit more babysitting on the execution front. And for that, Open Outcry still does serve a purpose. Let's see what our Eye of Sauron has found for us today. Listeners, first, it's going out to the land of cereal. In particular, Kellogg, ticker symbol K. I'm talking about this one on the show in quite some time. Uh, trading right now, 68 and a quarter. It's kind of been an interesting year. They kind of have done net on the year, kind of a whole bunch of nothing. <laughs> a year ago, they were trading 66.41. They are trading 68 and about a quarter right now. So they're up not even two bucks, a buck 80 on the year. So kind of a wasted year for Kellogg. And they hung out in this low to mid 60s range, it seems like, for almost the entirety of the year. And then into the beginning of this year until March 11th. And they sold off briefly below 60. 59 and a half was their low for the year. That was on March 11th. And they rocketed up. On May 9th to their high for the year, 74 and a half. So they finally broke their range on both sides. But ever so briefly, though, because then they came right back down again. And now they're back. And they got as low as 67, 76 on Friday. Now they are a little bit higher, about half a buck higher, 68 and a quarter. So this name just seems glued to the mid to high 60s range. <laughs> Let's see what our eye of Sauron found out here. Maybe someone expects it to. Break free of that range, and it looks like that is indeed the case. we got someone coming in and loading up on the 72 halves in June. 3,086 times they paid 20 cents for these. These are surprisingly tight. They're 15 cents at 20, given Kellogg does some paper, but not a ton. Uh, they looks like they lifted the offer on these. That's not, I guess, compared to the premium buys we've seen in the past. This is 20 cents. It's only a 28 vol at the end of the day. We've seen far worse than this, listeners. The stock was pretty much exactly here when these went up, 68 and a quarter. And no, there are no earnings. The next earnings is on August 4th. So Mr. Rock Lobster, this is some old school odd block paper in that it's some kind of very near-dated call love. You only got a few weeks on these. But compared to what we've seen over the past couple of years, particularly in the meme stock Palooza, where it seemed like no call was too expensive to buy, <laughs> these are comparatively reasonable, even if I don't really love them. But at least from a premium and a vol perspective, they're not uh, throwing the farm away. Mr. Rock Lobster, what are your thoughts on these Kellogg calls? Um, I, you know what? They're not They're not terrible, yeah, right? It's they're not just, terrible. Just, That's probably the best thing you can say about them. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, you know what? It's weird because there's just noted, noting that, you know, VIX is still like, so vol is still like, okay. So the mar broad market vol is relatively high. Um, but name volatility is, you know, is not as high. Um, I mean, so a lot of it can actually is relatively inexpensive. So um, actually, one of my, and one of my students brought up this Kellogg's uh, purchase. The oh my, the problem I have with it is the duration is just very short. You know, not like, a, not a lot of time to work, especially for this name. It's in very range bound all year. Yeah, it's just like, you know, is it like you know, is Warren Buffett going to buy it out or something? You know, I mean, it, last earnings cycle was pretty good. Well, it was it traded up to twenty seventy four bucks. So. <sighs> like you know it's one of those things where i i don't again this is i don't think it's a very it's not a cheap company it pays a good dividend and all that kind of stuff um so it's it is a it is a i would just call it a bold purchase on an out of the money call like some somebody clearly sees something that ain't there right now like <laughs> from just everything you could look at um in kellogg currently like the let's say the the so if you look at a synthetic straddle value, probably isn't a whole lot more than two dollars. So to to spend twenty cents on those calls that are, you know, outside of the range of any kind of reasonable wall is pretty. Yeah, somebody got to know something. That's all I'm saying. Somebody has to know something uh, to make that trade work. Because there's also some open some action on the seventy fives, right? So, you know, you see 9,000 of the 75s trading and they're like trading 10 cents. So, 
uh, you know, is this going to, you know, is, <laughs> I was going to say, are members of Congress out there buying <laughs> some calls and Kellogg's? What do they know? What kind of legislation is going to pass? Um, so, you know, are the Russians allowing wheat to be exported like <laughs> from Ukraine? Anyway, so it's all it just looks kind of oddball to me, to be quite honest with you. So it I, I would say keep this on the list. But somebody knows something if they're buying these calls. Somebody knows something, says the Rock Lobster. Even the size isn't crazy. It's not 10000 It's 3000 The price isn't crazy. The vol level isn't crazy. You're right. The only thing that really causes some consternation is the time frame. But then again, there's a reason why those other n- numbers are reasonable because the time frame is short. So there's no free lunch and options at the end of the day. What do you think of these listeners? You like these? Would you buy them? Would you more likely sell them? I know how I would probably lean, but I'm curious what you folks have to say on this. Let's pick up a few of these that we've reviewed in the past. Let's see if we can pay them off before we get to the uncle list of Mike's. Got to buy him some time. He hasn't done a strategy block in a while. I'm not sure if he remembers how to do it. Let's go out first to our April 18th show to uh, C3.AI Inc. This is ticker symbol AI. At the time, we profiled about 9,000 of the May 15 puts. By the way, it's ticker symbol AI on the year. This name was trading 60 bucks a year ago, and then it has pretty much sold off ever since. I won't tell you where it is right now. It's kind of a bit of a spoiler. Uh, Let's get to where they were this past month because 8,900 of the May 15 puts, that's what paper did. They came in and sold them for 32 cents, again, nearly 9,000 times. The stock was 19 and a quarter at the time. So, again, it was trading over 60 bucks on last year. It didn't quite top out on June 8th, but actually June 28th, so close to it. 66 and a half was the high for the year. When they put this trade up, the stock was 19 and a quarter, roughly. There are earnings, but not in this cycle, not until June. And looks like they looks like they were selling these, so they drew that line in the sand at the 15 strike. And the stock, Mr. Rock Lobster, closed on expiration in May at $18.22. So they would have worked out. However, looks like they didn't wait that long. So we have to tip our cap to them because people putting on a trade that works and then they take it off. How many times have we lamented? Oh, no one did anything, and then they got run over. So we can't give this guy a hard time. So he didn't get all of his twenty-five cent. Oh, excuse me, all of his thirty-two cents. He got twenty-five of it though. He came back in and closed them out on what day was this? May nineteenth. So almost exactly a month later, he came back and bought them back for seven cents when the stock was about eighteen and a half bucks. So he still made a decent amount of money. He made twenty-five cents almost nine thousand times. So right around two hundred twenty-five thousand bucks. So Mr. Rock Lobster. He drew a line in the sand. It was not that aggressive, but it was decent. He got a decent amount of premium, not a ton, but not nothing. Uh, he kept most of it, and then he took it off when the getting was good. You can't really fault this one, sir. At the end of the day, he pretty much made your significant other's Ferrari benchmark, so you can't, you can't laugh at that. Uh, no. I mean, this, this worked. I guess uh, this is a, uh, an, an enterprise artificial intelligence software company. So this is... Um, uh, kind of an odd one. Um, let me see here. Let's say, Tom, I, I wonder if they used to be named something else. Uh, then what, you know, with market cap is 2 billion revenues, two and a half million dollars. It's a small float, only a hundred million shares. So kind of a, kind of an, an odd little, uh, an odd little stock to be quite honest with you. But um, they have real revenue, and uh, somebody saw a line. Of, they also apparently they have nine dollars in cash. <laughs> so I don't know where they got that big chunk of change, but it makes the uh, it makes the company not super expensive. Uh, I guess oh, they, I guess they used to make a lot of money, and then recently they have not been making any money. So um, anyway, um, but an interesting an interesting. Uh, Put sale, but yeah, they did collect other bucks for sure. So, what can you say? They, it was, it was definitely a win for them. What can you say? Indeed, we don't profile a lot of wins, at least wins that people actually keep most of what they earn. So, we gotta, we gotta take those when we can, listeners. So, uh, tip our cap to our for our friend here in AI. Let's go out now around the same time, a couple of days later, April twenty first on the show. This was these were a couple of newcomers to the show at the time. This one here is. Equitrans Midstream Corp. ETRN is the ticker. They refer to themselves as E-Train, an American nat gas company. They have pipelines out of Pennsylvania. Uh, let's see. On the year, a year ago, they were trading at 916. They got up to 11 bucks in October. You know the saga of nat gas. You don't need me to re- 
regale you with it. At the time, back in April, we profiled someone coming in and scooping the main nines 4,624 times for 25 cents. Well, we thought they were scooping at first, but then as we kind of dug into it a little bit, we kind of realized that it looks like they were actually fading this pop a little bit because they actually were selling these. The stock at the time was 862, so it was higher. There were earnings in this cycle as well, May 3rd. So this one had some risk to it because anytime you're selling upside in nat gas, that could be dubious. Uh, they were doing some decent size. So you can probably assume maybe they had some shares to go as well, in which case they wouldn't mind dumping them at these higher levels. But anything short to the upside in nat gas these days has a has a potential to be run over. And it looks like ab- in factor in an earnings announcement as well. That's that's doubly risky. But it looks like these ended up working out. They did 4,624, then they came in to another 2,200, then another 1,200, another 1,000, a total of about 11,000 contracts on the day. This was not a small trade. So there's a, probably a good chance that this was someone who has a bunch of stock and they were willing to let it go at those levels. So they ended up hitting most of these for around 25 cents. And Mr. Rock Lobster looks like the stock closed on expiration, $7.27. They sold the nine strike listeners. So this worked out pretty good. Pretty much 12,000 of these were still open at expiration. So they did pretty good. Somewhere around 300 grand they pocketed on this bad boy. Mr. Rock Lobster, they were a little gutsy. But then again, if you have stock, not so much. They were probably just saying, hey, take me out of my stock at the nine strike. I'm good with it. And they didn't get taken out, Mr. Rock Lobster. So they pocketed 300 grand. And they live to sell another day, sir. Yes, I would. I would be of the mind that this is a. Uh, it's just a, It's got to be a call writer against stock, you know, because these, you know, you you factor in the divvy. The divvy is what uh, fifteen cents a quarter, and you know they pick up twenty cents for the upside, so they kind of double at least easily double their the take they're expecting for the div. So, um, I just I see this is this has call writer written all over it. In, in my mind there. I tend to agree. Now, let's see. Uncle Mike has call writing written all over him. It is time for the Strategy Box. It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for the Strategy Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Strategy Block, the portion of the show where Uncle Mike regales us with his 10-part I-9 coaching philosophy. Uncle Mike, have at it, sir. Oh, you don't want to get me going in that one, Mark. I don't think we should go down that rabbit hole. You slam the kids starting at the age of five. You tackle them brutally on the first play of the game just to let them know they're in a football game, right? That's right. Even though it's flag. (laughs) Even though it's flag. No. Um, What I want to go through today are vertical call spreads. And the reason I want to go through that is that Let's say that you believe that this market is down and you want to buy the dip. And if you want to buy this dip, you can buy stock, but maybe that's a little bit too risky for you. But then again, you're looking at calls and you're thinking, well, they cost a little bit too much for my uh, taste right now. We do have a VIX that's in the mid-20s. I mean, I know it's not uh, as high as it's been, but it's still fairly high and you're just uh, maybe not liking the idea of buying calls right now. And so... I want to go over, this is kind of a very basic strategy, but uh, it is one of my personal all-time favorites, and I think it's something that uh, would make a lot of sense for people if you are looking to buy the dip, depending on the underlying, depending on a lot of factors, but it's definitely something to look at, and that would be a vertical call spread. So let's say XYZ stock was up at 60, and now it's down to 50, and you really want to get into it because you liked it at 60, you love it at 50. And if that's the case, you're looking to maybe buy a 50 call on it because uh, that after all, you can participate on the upside for anything past 50. But you're looking at it and you're like, you know what, that's a little bit too expensive for me. Well, if that's the case, something to consider would be buying the 50-55 call spread. Now, the, what that does is that will reduce the price significantly, most likely, depending on how the options are lined up. Uh, but if it and if it doesn't, then it won't work. But a lot of times it does. And I'm just making up numbers. So please don't use this as a rule or anything like that. Uh, but once you do that, you then have participation on the stock from 50 to 55. Anything over that you don't get to participate on. So when buying a call spread, you can reduce the cost and essentially reduce the risk 
of paying for that premium. Now, a couple of disadvantages to it. The first disadvantage, you won't have as much gamma on your side. So in other words, when the stock goes from 50 to 52, let's say that that happens, you're not going to make as much money as you would if you just own the call because that 55 call, remember, is going to be working against you at the same time that the 50 call is working for you. So have that understanding. Now, as you get closer to expiration, you'll have the identical upside between 50 and 55 if you're at expiration, uh, but uh, it won't cost as much. But before expiration, it won't give you as much bang for your buck if it does go in your direction, most likely. Of course, there's many factors of option pricing, but typically you don't get the same bang for your buck with it right away. Now, the other disadvantage of it uh, is the fact that let's say the stock does go from 50 to 60 or 70 or whatever, you're capped off at 55. So that's another sacrifice with which you make when buying a call spread instead of buying a call. Now, if you don't believe the stock's going to go much past 55 anyway, then you're probably better off doing this call spread. You won't make all of your money right away or as quickly, but you do stand the chance of getting a much better price for the movement that you wanted in the stock. So that's a good thing about it. And then finally, the thing to consider with this is that you can set this up with any strike price you want, whether you want to go in the money, at the money, or out of the money. There's advantages and disadvantages to all of them. And you can use whatever time frame you want. There's advantages and disadvantages for all of them. I'll be releasing a video on my YouTube channel on call spreads, uh, hopefully to, by tomorrow. And if you have questions about how you can select a time frame or a strike price, you can refer to those videos on my YouTube channel as well. And that is the strategy block for today. All right, so he does remember how to do that segment. Okay, let's see if you remember how to do Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to Around the Block, the portion of the show where we break down what we're keeping an eye on for the rest of the week until our next episode on Thursday. Let's do a real quick payoff here of some of our questions of the week as well. Uh, we asked you last week with Vala Vol so low, VVIX back below 100 for the first time in over a year. Just the start of a new Vol regime or just the calm before the storm? And nearly 76% of you said it is the calm before the storm. So, Watch out out there, listeners, if you think we're heading into tranquil waters here in the middle of the summer. Uh, start of a new vol regime, only 14.5% and 9.7% say, hey, vol of vol is confusing. <laughs> yeah, I get it. It can be a confusing topic if you've never really encountered that concept before, the notion of volatility of volatility. And I see a lot of you asking about the uh, SIBO stuff in the chat. The Option Queen wants to know if we're going to go check out the new trading floor. Uh, yeah, maybe. We'll see. You know, they all usually invite us down to these things. They didn't have a big, at least that I could see, a big grand opening uh, celebration uh, out there. But maybe we'll go down and swing and check it out. Their new offices are pretty close. We can go check those out. Maybe we'll swing down to the new trading floor. You know, it's an interesting thing on some on one hand, these are kind of vestigial elements of an outdated era, right? On the other hand, they still do serve a purpose. In fact, that leads to our question of the week. It just went live a few seconds ago here. You guys can play along. At Options is the place to go on Twitter. We're asking you right now, the SIBO launched a new open outcry trading floor this week. Uh, so our question of the week is a simple one. Does open outcry still have a place in the modern options market, or is it an outdated relic of the past? Gave you three choices. Yes, it's still important. No electronic or bust or... What's open outcry? Get in there. That just went live literally a few seconds ago. So I don't think we, I, I, it's, it's all still tied at zero, zero, zero. No, it just went live. So we'll get the votes in, let you know a little bit later this week how things are looking. As we go around the horn, let's go back to the rocking is the lobsters. Mr. Rock Lobster, sir, what are you keeping an eye on until we gather here together on Thursday? Well, I guess waiting for the CPI number and seeing if this this rally has some legs and if it does, you know what what it will be. So, um, why do you care about inflation? I, the the Fed already told us it's transitory. We shouldn't yes, care about exactly. these things. <laughs> so, yes, that is that that's what I kind of is on my on my radar screen as of right now. So, mostly just the Fed. There's really not much earnings to go on, and just how high can these energy prices go? At some point, you know, OPEC is going to want to start producing more you know, into this, uh, 
you know, at 120 bucks a barrel, like gas in Maine is five bucks a gallon. So I don't really drive anywhere, but it's pretty darn expensive as far as I can tell. So um, anyway, that's uh, that's what we got going on here. Five bucks a gallon in the hinterlands of Maine, man. You're rivaling Chicago prices now. Let's go on out to the land of St. Charles, where gas is always a pleasant buck 85 a gallon. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, what is on your radar for the rest of the week? Well, how does Andrew not drive anywhere? What does he do? Take the subways out in Maine? That's what I'm kind of curious about. But in terms of uh, what I'm watching, uh, just I'm watching the numbers. I'll watch CPI, like Andrew said, uh, but also I'm watching just to see if we can break through the 4,200 mark on the S&P and see if we can hold the levels with which we are on the 10-year um, and see if that'll get some type of a rally. You missed the subtext there, Uncle Mike. Andrew never drives because he never goes anywhere. See, that's that's why he never drives anywhere. Oh, I get it. And the one time he left his compound to come to Chicago, he got stuck here for like an extra week. So that turned him off leaving the compound ever again. So we might see him once maybe in the next decade. Unfortunately, listeners, that music means we are done with this episode. Looks like our poll now, 60% saying yes, open outcry, still important. 40% saying no, again, just the early blush. We'll keep updating you on this throughout the week. At Options is the place to go. Mr. Uncle Mike, where should they go if they want to learn more about what you got going on or perhaps to debate you on your concussion-prone I-9 coaching methodology? My concussion-prone? It is not concussion-prone. I've had zero concussions under my realm in my entire career as a football coach, which spans many years. Anyway, with that, uh, feel free to visit my website, stcharleswealth.com. Uh, if you're looking for a financial advisor who uses uh, call spreads in some way, shape, or form, and follow me on Twitter, at Mike Tussaw, T-O-S-A-W. I've, been, I've had Twitter drought for a while, folks. Help me out. Let's get him some love on the old Twitters. And as a guy who doesn't need your love, he doesn't want your love, Mr. Rock Lobster, sir. If folks want to come to not give you their love, where should they go? What should they do? Uh, go to optionbit.com. Option, uh, go to mentoring uh, or, or uh, um, go to our uh, products page or really just call Ted. Say, hey, Ted, I've got I want to learn how to trade options. And I know that option pit is the place to do it. If you say you heard on this show, you get 10% off anything Option Pit sells just for saying that I'm the most handsome man handsome man in options. 888-TRADE-01. Oh, didn't you get the memo? They have updated the uh, secret passphrase. Now, now, no longer am I just the sexiest man in options. You now also have to tell Ted that I am also the best flag football coach in uh, known history. So you add those two oh. things together. <laughs> sexiest right. man in options and the best. Some might say the Lombardi of flag football coaching. You add those in there together. Or perhaps the Belichick of the modern era. Pick your poison. I'm not I'm not picky there. You tell Ted all of that. Then you get your discount. <laughs> we got to roll on out of here. We'll be back in a little bit for all you live cool cats with the crypto rundown. Got a new guest coming on there. Always fun to see the new areas of the crypto space we can explore on that show. Going to be doing that again in a little bit. All you on-demand folks have to wait until it hits the network. Then we're back again tomorrow with another great Pro Q&A on the docket. Listeners, we got Mr. John Brady coming in from RJO. You guys have a lot of questions about what's going on on the commodity, the futures options side. I know we'll also want to talk a lot about uh, the rates products. So if you have questions about all that stuff, start getting those in now. Should be a great meaty, meaty session tomorrow on the Pro Q&A side. Then we're back again on Thursday, another episode of the Option Block. Stay safe out there, everybody. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>